Okay, we started the recording. Uh, welcome to the Sensational, or excuse me, the uh, State Authorization Network SAN um, Open Forum for November. And as I was about to say, uh, our fall season has been all about the Sensational Awards. We have had two sessions previously with two winners, the Ohio State University and UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I had the pleasure of uh, going out to Ann Arbor to the University of Michigan to safely award um, the University of Michigan folks with their sensational awards. Uh, they had chosen right outside um, the big house. Uh, Ricky can correct me later, uh, but it was a it was a treat to go out there and deliver it to them. Um, I, I am amused. They had their uh, photographer there, and if you see in the center picture here, I've been telling everybody it looks like we're an acapella group. So um, so we look like an acapella group, but we had a very pretty day, and it was nice to meet uh, Ricky Lafosse and his team, who is here with us today uh, to talk about their award-winning project, Online and Hybrid Development Playbook. So I'm going to turn this over to Ricky. And Ricky, if you could, please, would you provide a little bio for yourself and your team? Yes, thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, and thanks again for this award uh, to San as well um, and for coming out to hand deliver it. Uh, it was a great time. It was the first time I got to actually see other human beings for quite a while. Um, and uh, my name is Ricky LaFosse. I'm the Compliance and Policy Lead uh, for the Center for Academic Innovation. Uh, and then I'm joined today uh, just by David Lawrence Lupton. We have other authors uh, you know, listed on that first slide who were not able to join us today. Um, he is a program manager also for the Office of, uh, Center for Academic Innovation. I'll let him give a, a bit more bio uh, in a moment. I'm going to start sharing my screen here um, with what is hopefully just the presentation. Yep. Okay, check that out. All right, so um, thanks again for uh, all joining this. Uh, the Online Hybrid Program Development Playbook uh, was started well before I joined the office. Um, this is my second year uh, with the team, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the origin story. But you know, when I, when I joined this, this playbook was about eight or nine pages. It's now approaching about 40 pages. So there's a lot of information here, uh, far more than we'll be able to get through. Um, I did drop a link to the playbook in its entirety uh, in the comments, and I'll go ahead and do that periodically uh, for anyone who's joining late. Um, and it's also linked to in these slides, which will be available to you all um, after the presentation. So as for a quick agenda here, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Center for Academic Innovation, or CAI. Uh, we'll then get into the inspiration for the OHP playbook. We'll then uh, overview um, how online and hybrid programs or OHPs uh, operate at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as how the playbook is used in that process. I'll then uh, take you through in a quick walkthrough of the playbook, just focusing on its key sections, its format, um, and then supplemental resources created from it. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the uses that go beyond compliance. Uh, you know, this is a very holistic document with uh, compliance featured heavily. It's probably over half of the playbook at this point, um, but it was predominantly a broad use operations playbook for all things online and hybrid program development at the university. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you know, our suggestions for how you might use the playbook to, as an example, to create playbooks of your own at your institutions, if, if that's appealing to you. Um, and we, we'd certainly welcome any feedback as well, so we can keep um, bettering our own playbook. Um, we'll have some open discussion on that point, as well as answer any questions you may have. So first, Center for Academic Innovation. This is not a central online education office at the University of Michigan. Uh, we are, we like to think of ourselves as an innovation hub. Um, we develop anything from learning tools. We have a robust open content uh, portfolio with uh, MOOCs and then what we call teach outs, um, which are, you know, basically uh, very short uh, online classes with any community leaders focused on specific topics as well as our faculty members. 
so we can share and dialogue uh, about pressing topics of the time. Um, and uh, the ultimate goal of the office in supporting innovation at the university is always to advance learning, facilitate problem solving, foster equity, inclusion, increase access and affordability. We have a quote there from our executive director as well. Um, now, about six or seven years ago, when the Center for Academic Innovation was first formed, there was only about uh, a handful of employees. We're now uh, reaching about 100 um, right now. Um, but important to note here, the University of Michigan is very decentralized. It's 19 schools and colleges. They're, they're all their little kingdoms. And we are there uh, predominantly uh, to collaborate and offer partnership opportunities to support the innovation of other schools and colleges. So we are, again, not a central administrative unit. Um, so the way we pursue these goals and the missions of the office, um, you know, to highlight just a couple of the things we do, I already talked about learning tools. Uh, we, we also, in addition, have uh, online degrees and open content. We have a public engagement uh, team. Um, we recently have gotten into extended reality as well. Um, and then the Academic Innovation Fund is really the thing that um, drives our partnership opportunities. This is a large uh, pot of money. Um, and when we partner with academic units, uh, we provide both in-kind support, whether it's learning experience design uh, support, uh, administrative support, uh, partnership access to you know, our main partners, Coursera, edX, FutureLearn. Um, and then you know, in addition to that, we provide additional financial support um, by working strategically uh, in alignment with our own mission. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over uh, to David. If you wanna yeah. step in uh, here and introduce can, yourself I, a little more as well. I, right. I can do that. Thanks Thanks so much, Ricky. And uh, hi everybody, thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is David Lawrence Lupton. As Ricky mentioned, I'm a program manager at the Center for Academic Innovation. I work on hybrid online and hybrid programs. Actually, I've been at CAI uh, approaching four years, not quite there yet now. Um, and having worked initially with MicroMasters programs on edX, which are uh, pathways to credit bearing opportunities. And then as we moved into the space of online degrees, I started working uh, with academic units to help them uh, uh, get prepared and to spin up these, these programs. Um, so talking about why we, we decided and, and kind of had the idea to, to come up with the playbook, um, driven uh, in no small part by the, as Ricky mentioned, it was underway by the time he got there. Um, in the absence of having Ricky, we needed a way to, to collect and, and kind of aggregate all of the information that we were finding out as we went along. Um, so the, the image here from Michigan Online, Michigan Online is the um, kind of portal platform that we use for the content that, that comes through uh, Center for Academic Innovation in terms of open uh, content courses, um, specializations and series, the teach out model. And uh, as of a few years ago, um, we were newly working with academic programs to create fully online degrees um, with academic units um, and doing so kind of newly uh, into that, that space. There was no central office uh, for online programs. As Ricky mentioned, we were a very decentralized university with, with 19 schools and colleges, all, um, you know, somewhat uh, able to, to talk to each other, but maybe not even sure or necessarily where the others are in, in, at different times um, with pieces like that. So we needed to right, coordinate efforts where we could, creating networks, um, finding expertise, developing procedures, and, and really to, to earn trust with the academic units that, that we really knew what we were talking about. Um, and to start thinking about, right, having resources available for folks that they could use as they're spinning up these, these programs, um, independent of the level of partnership um, that we may have. So we went about this, we started reaching out to, to key stakeholders and offices across campus. We really kind of did, did a lot of legwork to identify who those folks would be um, and just started working, trying to uncover gaps as we went along. So Ricky, if you could, uh, awesome, thank you. So when we entered into this space, um, there were roughly uh, 10 online programs um, already uh, in existence, uh, 10 online degree programs of some sort in existence at the university. 
Um, but there was no coordination uh, among them. Uh, they were their own independent kind of degree programs, um, unless they were within a, a the same college as the College of Engineering had a few. Um, but they didn't have coordinations or coordination with each other. And they didn't have, or they had varying levels of engagement um, with central units. Um, case in point, right? Something as uh, maybe, you know, maybe not mundane, but as, as kind of straightforward in the residential space as getting a student ID. Um, the question with the central MCARD office, that's what we call our IDs at, at university, um, it, it hadn't come up because the, the question of do online students get MCARDs? And if so, what are the processes involved in that? Had never actually, that connection had not yet been made um, for these, these programs, right? So there were just a lot of little, small, outstanding things like that that we could really fill in the gaps um, in doing so. And so, right, when we, as we identified these gaps and as we kind of collected information from folks, we were able to develop uh, communities of practice uh, around online hybrid programs so that we could invite the different programs together to start talking. Um, and while they might have, you know, in, in different areas, in enrollment management and uh, the student services that they provision and learning experience design, right? Having these opportunities to talk with each other and start to learn from each other. Um, and, and while they might individually take into account their own perspective as an ac academic unit, uh, as we are a center situated underneath the provost, right? We were able to take a, round, a look from the kind of the broader university perspective and the needs of the university. And in that sense, we really, had an opportunity to, to really be very aware and mindful um, and on top of these compliance issues uh, that pop up. Um, and along with that, and, and as Ricky said, right, we're not the centralized online programs, we, not all online programs run through our office um, or our center, I should say, um, because the, the partnerships that we choose are really about a degree portfolio strategy and, and thinking through not just what, uh, you know, what a degree might look like within an academic unit, but um, what other opportunities uh, are affixed or are part of and with that degree. So open content that might be available uh, from that degree, other opportunities in terms of pathways to credit through uh, ideas like master tracks what teach outs might spin out, short form content, other ways that we can expand the reach of an online degree without necessarily being within the auspice of an online degree and having ways to stack all of these pieces together. That's really uh, kind of a part and parcel to, to our position as, as a central unit and the direct partnership work that we have with, with some academic units. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have some opportunity to work with folks um, in other ways. And so as an online or hybrid program is going through the development and approval process, um, necessary step in that is, is of provost's approval. And uh, as part of that, right, they will reach out to our office or our center to um, start working through some of those compliance questions that, that Ricky uh, had, had kind of uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and in doing so, right, that's an opportunity for us, regardless of our partnership status, that we can start to uh, start off by giving them the playbook and say, you know, wh whether you are, we'll, we'll be partnering with you directly or not, here is kind of a starting point that will allow you to know uh, where these connection points are going to be on campus. And so, uh, Ricky, if you want to take back over and, and start walking through what that experience might look like for folks as they, they take that playbook. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, so I'm going to bring you into the playbook now. Kind of got to show you in real time where you can access it uh, through this website. Um, it is at the bottom of our policy page. Uh, for the Center for Academic Innovation, There's actually a lot of other policy uh, guidance if, if you're interested in other aspects of the office there. Um, so right down it, there at the bottom. Its location does not does not undermine its importance though. Bottom right. on the page, but first in our hearts. It, it probably should be on the top, let's be honest. But yes, uh, <laughs> it is on the bottom organizationally. Um, and 
So as you open this, you'll notice this is a Google document. Uh, this is really important for us, both for just tracking, um, you know, it, instead of having different versions of a PDF or something like that to keep track of, uh, we make a lot of edits here and it's really helpful to have that master list of everything that's changed throughout time. Um, and then, you know, we can always see how uh, we're progressing um, in our strategies and development. And this, this is going to be very helpful for years to come. Um, so table of contents here uh, does spell out, um, you know, pretty accurately the content here. Uh, there is, you know, a general legal disclaimer, uh, mostly because, you know, we, we do have this as open content. Any, anyone, any institution um, is free to access this and, you know, view just about all the resources. There are some linked resources uh, that are, you know, for University of Michigan eyes only uh, still at this point, but we try to be as open as possible um, with our uh, procedures. And, um, you know, from there, you know, we, we kind of state the purpose of this document. Uh, and then there are some administrative sections just about the University of Michigan approval process, um, which, you know, if your uh, institutions still don't have uh, specific approval steps for online or hybrid um, degrees, uh, this might be a, a good uh, benchmarking um, section for you to for you to look at and take back to your institutions. Uh, and then from there, the bulk of this uh, is compliance. Um, and our goal here, you know, each of these sections, you could you know, write basically a treatise on many of these. Uh, so a lot of knowledge uh, to disseminate. Um, rather than do that, we've tried to keep these sections very short, um, just citing uh, key points, um, linking out to additional resources uh, if helpful, which we also have tried to keep very short. Uh, but really, we want uh, our audience to know enough to know um, when, you know, basically just to issue spot to know when a challenge arises, um, there is resources for them um to support them in overcoming those challenges and then there's a network uh, that we've you know helped build at the university of michigan um, and there's a directory for who to reach out to when these challenges come up um, so we still we don't want individual program administrators to feel like they need to become the compliance experts but we want them to feel comfortable reaching out uh, to the appropriate individual um, and have just a background of information that might be needed to start those conversations. Uh, and then from there, we get into operational considerations, student accounts, this is a lot of uh, registration, enrollment, uh, financial aid. Um, we do have kind of a, a credit hour section in there that's doubled up in the compliance section as well. Uh, and then finally, student services um, towards the bottom. Um, so, you know, I, I think most of the audience here would be interested in the compliance section. So I'll just quickly review what we uh, keep in this section. Um, yeah, we start with just a general oversight introduction to the regulatory triad plus SARA. Um, then, you know, we get into out of state authorization. Um, again, it, it, as you can see from the format here, it's really just a brief overview. It's talking about, you know, who, who do you reach out to with direct expertise? In this case, it's, it's us, um, mostly due to our role in managing our uh, SARA participation. Uh, and then just the key points, uh, we link to our disclosure page quite frequently here um, that covers the basis for much of the compliance obligations. Um, you know, from there, we also talk about licensure. Um, Center for Academic Innovation is heavily involved in the professional licensure disclosures working group. Um, so we are again, kind of uh, the, the expertise um, at the university or at least part of that. Uh, and again, it's just, you know, very quick key considerations. We're going to link out to something broader. Um, so in this case, it's our uh, implementation guide. Um, then we get into marketing. This is all thematic. Uh, from there, you know, disclosure language, how to avoid misrepresentation, so on and so forth. Student data protection, privacy rights, just all the uh, compliance topics you should generally be um, look, uh, looking for. So I have a few of these um, uh, linked resources queued up um, just to give you an idea of what they look like. So most of them, uh, there's you know one for uh, 
a uh, keep complying resource that we, we developed for COVID that also links to many of these. Um, so if you want kind of a master list of these uh, supplemental resources, they're all kind of down here at the bottom of this page. Um, and you know, what each one looks like is, you know, so we've given you in the playbook, the general information, just very quick bulleted list. Here are the considerations you should have in here so you should contact. And then we link out and then we get a little more in depth um, talking about you know, what the compliance challenges are in the area. Uh, and then in practice, you know, depending on the audience here. So uh, most of these online education compliance guides are um, intended for an audience of instructors as well as uh, instructional designers or learning experience designers. So it is, you know, very course level detail, you know, what to do if you want to record students as part of a virtual class, for example. Um, and again, all of these are uh, Creative Commons uh, attribution. Um, so, you know, feel free to use adapt however you'd like. Uh, and then we just have an FAQ section for each of these as well as links to yet additional uh, resources. So, um, you know, these all kind of follow a similar theme. They're all two pages, same format, uh, covering each topic in a bit more depth. Um, and yeah, I won't go over all of them, but you know, at any time, if you have questions about any of these as well, uh, you know, we'll we'll get to questions about individual, but also feel free to email um, about any of these resources. Uh, for now, I'm just happy to be able to provide you with all of these and share them. Um, so, with that, I will come back to our slides here, yeah. um, and kick it back over to David. All right, thanks, Ricky. The um, so right, so as Ricky went through and, and showed some of those resources, obviously, I think um, there's uh, a, a key part of that about right as we've mentioned the compliance side and the, the section on on compliance or a lot of compliance issues being kind of put uh, front and center in the the playbook uh, in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, uh, when when sharing this out and 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 having it as a resource and holding it out as a resource for other uh, institutions to look at. Um, that really is the content that, that can be very evergreen, but at the same time, or not evergreen, but I should say um, is most relevant, I think, to, to other folks. Um, but there are other ways that, that folks can use this, uh, this playbook and hopefully be inspired to think through how they might be able to, to use the playbook as well. Um, as, as Ricky mentioned, there are areas in there about student services, and really this playbook for academic units is a way not just to kind of learn what the compliance landscape might look like, but also to start to understand and, and really solidify their understanding of what resources um, are truly centralized versus being very specific to the academic unit. Because um, many of these ideas about where to be uh, uh, going um, when it's a student who is uh, living on campus, it's very easy to send them to a certain office and not even consider um, how that interaction would go. But when you're working with an online student, it has to be a much more thoughtful process about what that, that experience looks like. And so this gives an opportunity for us to collect information and really have something of an understood kind of what a centralized and academic unit specific student experiences might look like for online University of Michigan uh, students. Um, also in terms of the learning experience, some opportunities to, to see um, what resources might be available in terms of right, the, the credit hours and creating some sense of, of guideline to help faculty members who are uh, learning how to teach in the online space, just some guidance in terms of thinking through what that learning experience is going to look like um, from that perspective. And what's next for the, the playbook? Well, uh, as, as Ricky has mentioned, right, we keep it as a Google Doc. Um, right now, it's, it's a, a document that is always being refined. And, and Ricky does a lot of work making sure that it is updated with any, um, any developments, uh, being able to pivot very quickly as we, we move to uh, kind of remote, remote, emergency remote teaching in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Um, everything like that, that that Ricky has stayed on top of this with uh, our operations lead and and our operations director and and our copyright uh, lead um, has been just incredible work. 
Um, we're developing processes that exist outside of compliance. So what the process for going through an entire uh, program design and development might look like, what designing courses or, or um, curriculum uh, may look like, how to develop a marketing plan and using the same idea of um, an ever living document that can be refined and, and kind of changed, but with the basic idea of it being a playbook that allows folks to understand the core concepts of how they move through this space. Um, we're also working on thinking through and getting all of these, these experts that we have identified in a playbook and thinking when we are able to see each other in person again and, and get into the same room about holding workshops with academic units that are interested in moving into the online space to kind of put them on the front foot of working with these groups. Um, and also, uh, I think the, the biggest part of this is that we want to continue to share uh, the work that we're doing uh, with you all so that you can find a way that, that hopefully it can help contextualize the work that we're doing. Um, when the, the when President Schlissel announced an investment in our, our center, he wanted us always to remember that we share our work broadly with other institutions, um, that, that we do this so that our potential uh, can be yours and that together it will be unlimited. Uh, virtually unlimited uh, through that sharing network. And so we're very excited to kind of continue working with you all um, to think through ways that, that we can always work to improve this playbook. All right. Yeah, I, with that, I think we got a, just a couple minutes for questions. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen actually so I can check into the chat as well. This is Cheryl. That was very comprehensive. Wonderful job. Wonderful job. Um, I think institutions uh, on our on our call today and, and others who navigate to your uh, playbook are going to find it to be um, very enriching and uh, thought provoking for what they can provide at their institution. I was especially interested in um, and so folks, please start putting questions in the chat. I'm just I'm just going to ask my question while you all are, are putting questions in. Um, how did you garner the trust to develop these partnerships across the institution. What was your what was your magic method? Um, uh, I can start here. Feel free to add, David. But um, you know, at least from the time that I've been at the university, um, there had already been a little bit of setup with just the collaborations with academic partners. Um, but often I find, you know, if it's with general counsel or en enrollment management, um, that there is, you know some need arises and nobody's really been addressing it since we, we do lack that online, um, that central online administrative office on campus. Um, so, you know, if we just start building something and submit the resources somewhere and start asking uh, for a little bit of collaboration and feedback, you know, this involves financial aid rules. Um, this involves uh, export controls. So we do that outreach um, and generally our partners are really um, happy that we have done that and now that they have you know somebody else to collaborate with and share in that workload yeah and and i think to, to add to that in terms of developing trust with the academic units um it's been a, a long process of of showing that we had a viewpoint in the online space instead of kind of uh we think about kind of two different directions towards online degrees and i think there's a lot of early movement of kind of we need just more seats at the table. And so how can we expand instead of instead of building bigger classrooms, how can we expand into online? The University of Michigan has gone about it from a different perspective. And we started with uh, MOOCs and kind of lower lift and maybe lower stakes um, pieces to really figure out what we were doing and to really figure out how we thought we could kind of do this online pedagogy well. Um, and as we've moved into that space, we've developed a lot of trust on campus as being uh, very knowledgeable in the online pedagogy space. And so when folks became ready and, and realized that, that the move to online was going to be kind of a necessary component for their, uh, you know, their, their future uh, as academic units, um, we were the, the clear partnership direction on campus um, that they wanted to, to work with. So that was, I think, a, a big part of that. Our executive director, you know, loves to tell stories about, you know, just building trust with academic units through good work and, and good partnership. 
That's fabulous. And so you all are go-tos. Um, we have a question here. Uh, Carrie asks, do you have an approval process for individual courses to be offered online or hybrid or just at the program level? I yeah, and so Ricky uh, dropped, dropped an answer in there. Interestingly, right, so we, we work at the, the program uh, level process. And then, as we mentioned, in terms of decentralization, once once a program is moving online, the approval of individual courses is really done uh, at that academic unit level. So different academic units do it very differently. Um, some, you know, are basing a lot of the, the work that they're doing um, on kind of residential courses and, and kind of working with the faculty who are developing those courses already to think through how it might be developed online. Others are going through an entire course proposal process that is exactly the same as the residential course. They might be, you know, certain faculty might be asked to put together a proposal in a certain area, but then after that, they develop the proposal and, and bring it to um, a faculty committee. So there are different, different uh, kind of governorship, governing ideas uh, with different academic units. Well, we are already at the bottom of the hour. I think we probably could talk for, for quite a long time on this, but you've all have done a fantastic job and I thank you for sharing um, all of this with us. And I know people will be um, reviewing it later as well. Um, I just want to um, point out that we have our final uh, presentation of Sensational Awards in December, the second Tuesday of December, our regular open forum time. It will be a special one hour edition of the uh, open forum because the University of Kentucky, who is our final uh, recipient, has two awards. They won the Compliance Innovation Award for their field placement coordinating as much as I have this has been fantastic this fall to have um, all of you all displaying your projects for us and so um, looking forward to uh, next month as well so Ricky and David thank you so much uh, for being with us and uh, for allowing me to come spend a few minutes on your campus to uh, take a few outside pictures and um, everybody have a fantastic day and we'll be talking with you soon best to everybody <laughs>